Good evening and welcome to another edition here on a beautiful Friday morning in a beautiful Friday night, sorry, in Georgetown, Guyana. This is another episode of A Politically Incorrect. My name is Kian Jabour, and as usual, I'm your host this evening. I have a very special guest with me this evening. Um, someone that has been at the forefront of politics over the last couple of years, was an integral part of all that has happened during the 2020 elections, um, took on the role all on his own shoulders to go all the way to the CCJ uh, when it came to that election um, saga, uh, was definitely part of the recount, the container and ballot watching, um, had his role to play in the media and educating everybody on what was occurring. So um, I ha my guest needs very little introduction once you see him. <laughs> this evening I have Mr. Timothy Jonas with me. All right. And we are going to be discussing a few areas um, that have been of interest uh, to the public lately. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into it. Our show is only an hour long, so I, you know, you know we like to hit the ground running here. So, Mr. Jonas, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you very much for having me. A yeah. pleasure. <laughs> and as usual, um, you are in, heavily involved in politics, maybe not as much as we would like to have been seeing you lately. I know that has been the large criticism and um, I, I hear you're with me now, so I'm going to take it now that yourself, along with um, the political organization, Anug, that your um, general secretary for, is going to get more involved now. And, and let me ask you, how is Anug doing? What's been happening with it? And, you know, maybe we can give us some updates on where we stand at the moment. Well, <laughs> for full disclosure... Kian is an executive member of, of Anug, so um, <laughs> we're selling ourselves here. We are, we are two people pulling on the same side of the tug of war. Anug has been in a, a kind of holding position. We, after the elections were finished, we continued to try to consolidate. We have a small but loyal membership, and that core group is solid and reliable, and we are building on it. That's, to me, our main strength, because first of all, it takes some courage to publicly turn your back on the two large ethnocentric parties and to choose a third path. And it takes courage to maintain that um, through thick and thin, even though you know you're not going to make too many friends doing it. So the people who are there are the people who have been tested and who are loyal. And I think we have a good foundation that we are building on. The reason I say we're in a holding position is, as a lot of people know, we have been waiting for a chance to have a seat in Parliament. Now, let's be frank, let's be factual. When the elections were finally and realistically counted, and of the 65 seats, PPP were allocated 33, it gave the PPP a majority. Um, and therefore, our first intention was delayed, I wouldn't say defeated, because the fact is that with 33, the government controls parliament, and we've seen that. Um, we've seen that in the budget that the government run news, um, news agencies proudly announced was successfully passed in parliament. Well, of course it was successfully passed. You got 33 to 65 votes. So we see that happening. And that's part of the um, the game. That's part of how it works here. The reason that Anug is sitting down waiting is that we are trying to move away from what we see to be the noise, the, the tit for tat, the, the exchange of insults and exchange of criticisms to the point that you've got the Speaker of the House prohibiting words like corruption and incompetence, um, vague accusations that don't condescend to details, that don't inform the public, educate the public, don't lift us up. We want to move away from that, and we want our conversation to be about solutions. So I believe it's important to have a voice that people can hear that is not rabble-rousing, is not decrying someone, is not shouting down. 
but is saying what is good and is saying what is bad and is doing so with a view to hopefully present a solution so that there can be a path that everybody sees is one that can possibly lead to improvement. We have so many opportunities. The latest opportunity is gas and oil, and we have so much money at our disposal because of gas and oil. And people have criticized me for calling it free money, but I'm, I'm sorry, that's what it is. We didn't, we didn't go and drill, we didn't go and sell. All we did is we sat, we sat back and we waited for a poorly negotiated contract to bring revenue from us that other people are um, drilling the oil and, and earning money from. So we have a bank account in New York that's growing exponentially because of oil revenue. It's separate from the consolidated fund, which may be cause for alarm, but there is some oversight. And again, we need to explore the system that exists to see if the oversight is sufficient for the use of that oil money and if there is transparency and if every side in Guyana has a voice on how it is to be spent. So we need to look at the good and the bad and we need to present solutions and hopefully over the next two years you will see that that is the tone that is most helpful and to me the only tone that any patriotic individual can take. <laughs> Great. Um, well, that actually is a fantastic segue into our our next conversation, because as um, well, I guess as you eloquently put it, our free money is uh, is here in our bank accounts and at our disposal, and has been um, maybe into the middle or so of APNU's term, which would have maybe been twenty seventeen or eighteen, I think, in which that money would have started to flow into our bank accounts. And now that uh, the PPP has taken over government, um, that money is there and accessible. Um, as of recent, we saw the 2023 budget passed um, uh, by, by the parliament. And it is one of, uh, it's not one of, it is our largest budget, expectedly so, um, in our history. And what is interesting is one of the heavy criticisms that uh, had, been, had been looked at, had, had been voiced um, when this budget was presented was the lack of, of, of drop or, or, or reduction in taxations. So, um, you know, looking at everything that's going on in and around Guyana, I think, um, you know, when it comes to where Guyanese tend to voice their outcries most is feeling that personal pressure that is put onto them by the state. Um, granted, as we know, every, everywhere in the world, and rightfully so, which is any stable economic environment, taxes have to be paid to ensure a country is upkept. So I guess my question to you to pick your brain a little bit, talking about solution-based, as you mentioned earlier, what are your thoughts on on the government not necessarily taking those steps just yet, um, and and more so the steps that they have taken. What what are your opinions so far? What is that's a good question, and you're right. The budget is very large. I think it's forty percent larger than the previous year. Um, there's a lot of money available, and overall, there aren't many large errors in the budget. The government has identified where there is a need. So education, security, um, social needs, that kind of thing, and has allocated money for it. The problem that we have always seen in Ghana is not identifying the need, because every guy needs to sit playing dominoes in the bottom house knows where we have needs. We got potholes on the roads. We got nurses and, and doctors that aren't well qualified, aren't well treated, and are working in hospitals that aren't well equipped. So we know where there are needs. We know that our teachers are under-resourced. We got pictures in the newspapers of teachers being attacked by parents and taking extra measures to defend themselves and the fight between teachers and, and the teachers' union and the government and that kind of thing. Every guy in these knows where the problem is. The issue is not so much the allocation of funds as set out in the budget as the implementation of the plan. How is this money spent? And I think that's where we're falling down. But you specifically asked about the 
issue of taxation. And I think that's important, especially in the context of the well-touted and well-advertised campaign of one Guyana. You see, our GDP is growing. We are seeing new, very wealthy Guyanese that are coming on board, benefiting from government contracts, the people who build the roads, the people who build the sea defenses, the people who do all of these things, getting contracts. But the reality is that the average Guyanese who is going to work from 9 to 5, or who is working in the rice field, his life hasn't changed very much. The average porter carrying goods on Regent Street or trucking pumpkin into border market, his life hasn't changed. And if in our country we see what I'm afraid we are going to see, which is a, an increase in the disparity in wealth so that we have the very wealthy elite driving in their tinted Prados and overtaking the people who are destitute, who are poor, who are unemployed, and who do not see light at the end of the tunnel. If we have that disparity in wealth, we are going to have social disorder, and we are going to have a breakdown of social order on a repeated scale. One of the problems I have is that I don't see that any measures are being taken to address that. If you want to look for social disorder, you just got to look at the last six months in Ghana. Six months ago, you had that it was Golden Grove. You had a protest from Golden Grove when people came down the East Coast protesting, looting in Maripo in an act that was unforgivable and unacceptable, dispersed with their loot, and we've heard nothing further about that. Just a few days ago, you had the Buxton inc incident when a car was stopped at Buxton and the Buxtonians came out. Now, there are a number of questions you have to ask. How is it that in a village, you suddenly have a ready-made crowd of people who are available in the middle of the working day? What does that say about unemployment? What does that say about the youth who are there? What does it say about their state of mind and whether they are happy or not? Now, if we have large groups of people who are in the middle of a working day doing nothing and willing to come out to confront police, to, to steal, to break up minibuses, to rob people who are passing at the drop of a hat, we got a problem. And yet, from six months ago when it happened from Golden Grove to now, there has not been a single change in policy or a single change to say, look, we have a problem and this is how we're going to address it. And I think that shows a failure that we can't ignore because it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse unless we do something to help the people who are at the bottom. Now, again, as I said, we are not here just to criticize. We're here to talk about solutions. And I want to have this discussion in the context of we're seeing the problem. We are seeing that one half of the society says, hmm, the government is doing really well. But the other half of the society says, we're ostracized, we're not happy, we are suffering. And it doesn't matter which government is in power, you have the same conversation. A half says, oh, power to you, and the other half says, no, I don't like what's going on. So how do we fix this? In the present circumstances, when you look at the budget, the first problem I have was that the income tax threshold went up to $85,000 or something like that. Now, you cannot realistically in our society say to a person that they must live and fend for themselves on $400 US a month. It's not going to work. Not with the cost of food, not with the cost of accommodations, not with so many people coming into the country from Brazil, Venezuela, competing for rental spaces, competing to buy the same food, competing for jobs. It's not going to work. And not with the people who are living in the luxury villas, in the gated communities, who come out in their prados and show huge amounts of wealth. And you're seeing that visibly. We are going to have a problem. So I believe that one criticism I would make of the budget is, first of all, a minimum wage needs to be imposed that certainly shouldn't be less than $125,000. And a tax threshold should be imposed that should not be less than $175,000. And I want to go further. 
for the first time in Guyan, Guyana's history, we have foreigners who are coming into the country who we should welcome. Venezuelans, Cubans, Brazilians, Americans. They're coming in. Some of them are coming in qualified as engineers and making lots of money, renting the expensive places. Others are coming in because things are so bad where they are. But I believe that these people should be pulling their weight in terms of tax. And I believe that they should be pulling Guyana weight as well. So they should be taking some of the burden of Guyanese. So when I say the tax threshold should be 175,000, it should be 175,000 for Guyanese. It could be a little less for foreigners. So that the foreigner who has a differentiated tax regime is at a slight disadvantage to his Guyanese counterpart. The reason I think this is important is also at the upper end of the scale. You see, we've talked about local content and we've passed legislation that is not really dealing with local content, although I hasten to say the government's heart was in the right place, but in its implementation there are flaws and in its conceptualization there were errors. If, SO, if Exxon needs an engineer and they're willing to pay this engineer $5,000 a month, chances are there is not a Guyanese engineer who is competent to do the job right now because culturally we've been doing agriculture and mining. We don't know about oil and gas. But if we had a tax regime that required that any foreign engineer who comes into the country has to pay a yearly sum for the visa, the work visa that he has to be in his country. That yearly sum he pays for that work visa it can immediately be allocated for an education fund so the Guyanese have access to education and there is a larger pool of money in education for our future engineers. We can also provide that the tax that a foreign engineer pays is higher than the tax that a Guyanese engineer pays. So that the Guyanese engineer, once he sees his foreign contemporary and he decides he wants that job, he is at a competitive advantage immediately because he's already living here. The foreigner got to come and find a place to rent. His family's already here in the school system. The foreigner got to come and should not be benefiting automatically from free health and free education, but should be paying for private school and should be paying a special amount for NIS as a foreign resident so that he is entitled to use our health system. So that that $4,000 that that foreigner is earning is really $3,000, whereas the Guyanese is earning four. And because he's at that competitive advantage, we won't need to be anguishing about local content and are we treating the Guyanese fairly. We are giving them the edge when it comes to competitiveness on the market. And I think that if we work that way, we make our citizens first-class citizens. One of the problems we have is we're so accustomed to being oppressed that we don't even see our oppression after a while. And if we can change our mindset so that we become the first class citizens and that people want to be Guyanese, we then will have another problem that also needs to be solved urgently. We have a lot of foreigners applying for Guyanese citizenship. Now, to me, that's a problem because we have a limited health facilities limited education facilities, and yet I've seen some um, nationals from China, from the States, from Europe, who come and get citizenship and then use that citizenship to get mining concessions, which are only available for Guyanese, so small and medium scale mining. They get um, exemptions and they can make applications for various exemptions as Guyanese. That shouldn't be the case. We should not be for sale, and if we recognize it potentially, Guyana is going to be a place like Japan, where the passport is very important, where it's wonderful to be Guyanese and everybody wants to be Guyanese. Then we have to start being careful on these foreigners who are coming in to work and who we want to work here, but we have to understand that they are coming to help us. They are not coming to take advantage of us, and we have to set the system for that to happen. Good. <laughs> All right. Excellent. You know, um, you hit on some, I think, one of the key points that has taken the country by storm, and that is the local content policy that had been put out some time ago. Um, uh, as, we had, as we had 
noticed with the ramps um, uh, court case that 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 took place um, because they were not issued their local content certificate. What we found happening was um, the laws, and and I mean you being you know one of the foremost corporate lawyers in the country, I'm sure you're abreast with with this uh, matter. But what had ended up happening was because the citizenship laws are set the way they are currently, you do not have to be born in Guyana to be considered a full citizen. And that, and, and what's interesting about that is that I don't believe personally that that is a problem, okay? Because many countries do it around the world, all right? Um, you don't necessarily need to be born in a certain country, but once your direct parents often come from that country, you as a, as a child are given that citizenship automatically. Um, different countries, different scenarios, but it is done in many countries, especially first world countries around the world. Um, so what you touched on not too long ago was, was changing a tax regime, uh, a tax, uh, you know, our, our taxation uh, system in order to, to, as you put it, make Guyana, Guyanese citizens first class. Um, what are some of, um, of the concepts that you know of or think may be the right direction when it comes to those citizenship laws? Because I think that is one of our key areas that need to be looked at as a fundamental um, issue when trying to determine how the allocation of, of these resources and, and the benefits of these resources are going to be distributed amongst Guyanese. So, I'll, you know, I, I'll let you tell me what your aspect is on that local content side. That's an interesting question. I, I firmly believe a Guyanese is a Guyanese. You don't take that away. I have noticed that in other countries, before you become entitled to the benefits that are offered, there is also a residency requirement. I can give you an example. England. Um, in England, if you're an English citizen, you get, you pay a different amount for their education system. But only if you have been resident in England for a period of, I don't know many years, five years or something, before you start that education system. So it makes sense to me that a Guyanese is a Guyanese, but does he come and take advantage of what I see in a few years should be an extraordinarily good University of Guyana for free or at a lower cost? Hmm. Or should it not be a requirement that before he comes to apply and enter the University of Guyana and pay the tuition fee that a Guyanese should pay, he should have been resident in Guyana for five years first. Mm -hmm. So I think residence requirements are often useful mm -hmm. before you can benefit from the limited infrastructure that we have that I think is going to improve. I think our healthcare will improve. I think that our, our medical system will improve, our education will improve. I hope to see that the University of Guyana becomes you know, a leading institution in the Caribbean. But if folk are coming back, a Guyanese cannot be treated as less than Guyanese, but there are resident requirements that I think might usefully um, apply. So that could potentially be the next step, because as, as you mentioned, and, and again, through my experience as well, what, um, what usually happens around the world is citizenship is one aspect of the law, and then residency is another. So what they would then tend to do is they would look back at your, obviously, travel um, re history, to see how long you've been in and out of the country with with their computerized, uh, you know, electronic passport system. Obviously, they can tell that. And again, uh, obviously, the very fundamental aspect is a is a computerized system that everyone is linked to. All the different aspects, whether it be the tax the tax aspect or the or the criminal, uh, the police aspect, the judicial aspect, everybody kind of has access to the same information. Uh, you know, through a press of a button, because obviously if you don't want to go through the bureaucracy, it, it, it fails between there. But then the second part of it, too, that they look at is your tax returns, is how much money you have been putting into the system to determine what benefits you are able to reap. And and this is systems that are used around the world. We know countries like Canada and England, et cetera. I, I don't like using the States as an example, even though I know most of our Guyanese are over there. But when you look at the leading countries in the world when it comes to standard of living, etc., you realize that whether a citizen or not, 
you only reap as much as you contribute, all right? And they tried to make the system as equitable as possible. And I think that is what is a very, and I say equitable instead of, um, instead of equality, because the equitab equitability, I guess, if that's a word, <laughs> is the fact that, you know, everyone is not at the same economic financial level. Whether you've been out of the country and you come back wealthy, or you've been out of the country and you come back poor, you have to have certain fundamental uh, areas in society, whether it be health, education, security, mainly uh, infrastructure, etc., transportation, public transportation, that you can have available to you. So what, um, what some of the areas that you look at is that exact residency aspect. So now we are getting into something a little bit more technical, and this is what I think you know, you know, I like to make sure I give everybody a heads up when it comes to these types of conversations, because we have to understand that these issues are always multi-tiered. And when you solve one, very often you can create a new one. And why I'm, why I'm, what I'm getting at, what I'm alluding to here is if we then create a system and force more people to be taxed and pay their taxes, in a system like Guyana that we know, I, I, can, I, can, I can tell you, maybe have been created for leaks, and then in other areas are, are, are downright set to control and, and as you, the word you used earlier, oppress, where certain aspects are not given freely to everyone, but only to certain groups in society. You know, I, I guess vehicle, um, uh, duty-free concessions on vehicles can be one of them. Right, because a vehicle will end up being an asset if you have a duty free, but it's a huge liability if you're paying full taxes on it in Guyana. So, you know, as some people use vehicles for income, as some people use it for you know leisure, pleasure. My question to you then is, what are some of the areas when it comes to taxation, which is necessary for contribution, do you think can be looked at, and you know maybe even discuss that that vehicular one, for example, as as your example. That's, that's a good question, and you're right. Our system is so porous, mm -hmm. partly because we have this culture of avoidance and evasion um, of laws that we inherited from Burnham days. But looking at it as a simple question of maths, if you need revenue of $100 and you got 10 people that you get any revenue from, each of them got to pay $10. It's that simple. But if you can find 100 people, then each person is only paying $1 and is not even going to feel that. And you're still getting your $100 revenue. So how do you spread the net wide enough so that by, uh, by catching more people in the tax net, you are therefore in a position to ease the burden on each of them? Mm -hmm. And I think that there are ways to do that. And I'm glad you brought it up. Let's look at the largest area of private employment that I can think of immediately off the top of my head, because you caught me by surprise with this question. Um, mini buses. Mm. Every teacher and every public servant and every NIS employee who is coming to town on his or her way to work jumps into a mini bus, and when they're leaving, they jump into a mini bus and they pay the fare. And there are thousands of these buses throughout Guyana. And each minibus, think about it, each minibus employs possibly two drivers used in rotation and two conductors used in rotation. So you have two drivers, two conductors, if the minibus is on the road for 16 hours a day, and you have the owner. And the owner earns enough money from this minibus that after two or three years, he can buy a new one. So he can put together another $8 million, $9 million, and buy another bus. The conductors and the drivers earn their money. They work hard. But they earn a reasonable amount of money. And I guarantee you, they earn more than the same teacher and the same nurse and the same NIS employee who's paying them to get to town to go to work. None of them pay tax. Whereas, so none of the bus, none of the bus, bus conductors or drivers, conductors, or drivers, owners, or, uh, people will criticize me for using absolutes. But let's say two percent of them pay tax. I don't want anybody to come quarreling with me to say I'm a bus driver and I pay tax. So let's say a small minority pay tax. But we know that every single nurse, 
every single NIS mm-hmm. employee, every single public servant who Teacher. earning mm-hmm. that 100,000, 125,000 ridiculous wage is paying tax on that. Right. Now, if the state has to make a certain amount of money, necessarily it is in the interest of the state and in the interest of those public servants and nurses and teachers that those same bus drivers and those same conductors and those same taxi drivers and the people who are working in the small bottom houses, making furniture or or doing whatever they're doing, the people who are living by wits but avoiding the tax system, staying under the radar, they need to be brought in. Now, insofar as you have identified a large group who are not paying taxes, how do you solve the problem? My suggestion would be that if every minibus pays as a road license $200,000 a year, everybody will gasp, $200,000 a year. But let's look at it realistically. That's about $18,000 a month. That's one tank of gas. Mm -hmm. And they use much more than a tank of gas, you know, in two days. (laughs) So it sounds like a lot, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And in answer to the protest, how can we be expected to pay this $200,000, $250,000 road license just to have our bus on the road? You say, but you should be paying tax. And if you're paying tax, you can treat that as an expense to reduce your declared income and therefore reduce the tax you're paying. So you have in, incentivized these people mm-hmm. to make a tax declaration and declare their tax. And they say, but I still can't afford it. But then you say, but wait, you own the bus, but you have two drivers and two conductors. Surely you can declare the expense of the salary you pay these drivers and conductors mm-hmm. to reduce your own declared income. So you incentivize them now to declare to the GRA what the number of people they're employing and how much they pay them. Mm -hmm. The GRA is then in a position to ask those drivers and conductors, where's your tax returns? Mm -hmm. You immediately have increased by thousands Mm -hmm. the number of people who are brought into the net and are paying taxes. And by doing that, you can raise the tax threshold to Mm $175,000 and give an ease to those same teachers and nurses who are paying tax on the pittance that they're earning now. Widen the net, and there are simple, easy ways to widen the net. That I, I don't think you, you have to exert yourself overly to get it done. Right. So I think that's a, a way to do it. The, the other point I want to make is that if you're earning $100,000 a month and the threshold is eight to 5000 you're making the tax man read your form that you have to fill out yearly on your tax declaration when you're paying $5,000 a month. Because your taxable income will be $15,000, you pay less than a third, but let's call it $5,000 a month. It's not worth your while. It's not worth the taxman's while. Mm-hmm. It's not worth the salary of the clerk in the GRE who got to read through these bundles of forms. Raise the tax threshold so that they are dealing with smaller quantities of paper and therefore mm-hmm. can be more incisive and more careful in terms of the reviews that they are doing and broaden the net to bring in those people who you know are there earning money, power to them, but also need to be contributing. Mm. So uh, there are ways to get this done. All right. You know, it, it, we get into a very touchy topic in Guyana. And, you know, I, I know all the Guyanese that are listening, the, the bus conductors, and those residing here can understand. To add one more dollar of expense onto their you know, daily income or, or monthly income, really at this point in time, because the living continuously rising is an absolute burden. And I can tell you, you know, as you know, as someone that runs a business, etc., it is so extremely burdensome right now for, for the average Guyanese to even consider, especially with the free money that we spoke about just now, to even consider um, um, having their expenses raised, whether through taxes or any means for that matter, regular cost of living. I think um, what needs to be discussed is the benefits that are are sown from that, um, from from contributing to a a working system. And I'm I'm going to speak about something here for a second, and I I want you to chime in where you want, because I found the largest issue that I've, that I've um, interacted with um, in the public here in Guyana is that it, the, the lack of exposure and understanding 
of what uh, a working system should be like is what kind of escapes those that are, are asked to contribute more. So what I'm getting at is immediately, and, and it will be a, it'll be a complaint across the board in a country like Ghana, I ain't even want to pay no taxes because I ain't getting nothing back for them. All right? It don't make sense I pay in taxes because it's the same black coat I get in. It's the same corrupt policeman I still got to pay. It's the same hospital I go in that I frighten and I risk my life every time. It's the same, I, I can't even send my child to school because it's unsafe. It is the same complaints that you will continuously get. Okay, my house flooding, et cetera, et cetera. All right, every two days my appliance blowing because of the surge of power, et cetera, et cetera. So what we need to be very cautious with, and I think this might have to be spoken about on a holistic level in trying to resolve because we know that there are many minor aspects that are contributing to it. But I want you to speak to a little bit of what you might consider a working system and incentive for those people to accept more burden. You know, we talk about changing our mindset. We talk about creating solutions to the problems that we have. You know, um, I, as you said, Anug wants to go into parliament and create a more solution-based conversation. These are the questions that will be asked. So as a, as a citizen here, you know, you're, you, you, you're, you're now talking to 10,000 people. How do you convince them to take this burden on and things will get better. I know this is a hard question to ask because it's so overarching, but you know, you have to start looking at changing the mindset, as you said. So what's your, what's your take on that? Well, this goes back to competence in our leadership. Mm -hmm. You see, as you have said, we got a lot of money. There's a lot of money in the budget. So you allocate a lot of money for education and the taxpayer who is accustomed to his oppression to the extent that he doesn't even recognize his oppression anymore, legitimately says, roads got potholes, child not being taught in school, I gotta pay to send my child to lessons. Um, why am I why am I paying taxes for this? It's it's a difficult chicken and egg situation. But what I would say is confront that person with the nurse who is earning a salary from the Georgetown Hospital or from St. Joseph's Mercy Hospital, has her income tax deducted, his, his income tax deducted before it even reaches uh, the nurse. And let the bus driver, let the farmer, look that nurse and teacher in the eye and say, I don't care. Too bad for you. You got to pay tax. But even though I'm earning more money than you, I am happy to avoid my obligation, even though I drive on the same road, walk on the same sidewalk, go to the same hospital for free treatment, and send my child for the same free education. There has to be a recognition in the population that we either all hang together or else we will all suffer separately. And I, I think there's a recognition that that is happening. Mm. I, I think that more and more people are recognizing that there are responsibilities that have to be met, and the only way we can deal with those responsibilities is if we all equally bear our burden. And if there are people who are not willing to do that, they got to be encouraged. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, all right. I guess that, you know, you, we, we, we we're watching, obviously, a country that has been torn since the beginning of our history. Um, and now the conversation is, well, we have a lot more money now, we got oil, we have opportunity, but y'all need to figure out how to come together now. And it gets, you know, I, what, I've, what I've found, um, and, and through my personal analysis, is when you look at the business environment and, and the employed environment and, and those people that are earning income, whether paying taxes or not, and in any real business environment in the country, what you found is a lot of doggy dog, all right? There was, you know, I, I'll even tell you, and I, I'm sure lots of businessmen can agree, they're still very uh, against partnerships. You got to do it on your own. You got to reap all the benefits as much as you can because, and, and this again is my analysis, is at that time, the pie was very small. And 
when it came to what was available for, you know, up for grabs, if you didn't fight for yourself, once you had to share that little slice that you're getting or those crumbs, then you weren't exactly succeeding or progressing in life. So what we ended up finding now is with our newfound fortune, the pie has significantly grown. And we have to now change an entire mindset of saying, listen, folks, we all are going to be able to benefit here if we hold one head. But we're dealing with a political environment that is not allowing this, that is not encouraging it for that matter. Yes, one side may be preaching it. The government has and the president's initiative of the one, Guyana, etc., has, has been speaking about it a lot. And then you see every two days civil unrest in, in, in various villages around the country. How then do we look at this on a political level? Because as we know, Guyana is extremely hyper-political. Every decision, every aspect of our lives is heavily politicized. How then do we look at this as a political level to figure out how we can come to a resolution of this? Tell me some solutions that you have in mind on a political side of things that can make people come together. Well, the only way that I can see it happening is actually it involves a very big risk. You see, the governments of the successive governments of Guyana have centralized power. So they have kept all power among a very small n number of the very elite within the party. And they don't let anybody else make any decisions. And I think that's a mistake. That's a recipe for what we see, which is we remain one of the poorest countries in the hemisphere. We have to decentralize power. And if we decentralize power so that the public sees that decision-making is done at different tiers through different levels in the country, then, first of all, there's greater accountability. But second of all, if someone is incompetent or if someone is corrupt, and I use those two words deliberately since apparently they're banned in parliament, <laughs> you can't hide behind the bureaucracy. You are directly accountable to the people. I'll give you an example. The system in Georgetown is that in when you have elections for to appoint the folks in city council, they are appointed from the wards. And when the city council individuals, when the council is elected, that council, by the uh, majority decision, decides who their mayor is going to be. Now, the end result of that is we have seen mayors of Georgetown who, first of all, would never win an election on their own strength, who remain in power for years uh, um, on conscionable lengths of time, and who have done nothing for Georgetown. The reason is that the because Georgetown happens to be a place where APNU has the majority, the majority of the councillors will be APNU, answerable to APNU, and then will take instructions from APNU as to who to appoint as their mayor. So we have a mayor who can do anything and is not answerable to the people of Georgetown because they can't vote him out. Mm -hmm. And the next go around when you have elections, they're not voting for the mayor, they're voting for this little area that they live in. And the winner, who is likely to be an APNU person because Georgetown is, a, is um, an APNU stronghold, will take instructions and will put an APNU um, candidate up as mayor. Now, that lack of personal accountability means that if you want building permission to put up a new building, you put it in, and years later you haven't heard from them. And who do you complain to? The mayor? He doesn't care because you can't vote him out. If you want to get a certificate to pass a transport and the mayor and the city council has to give you the certificate, you can wait months. If you want anything done, the level of corruption and the level of inefficiency is such that we ignore, if we can, that there is a mayor and city council because they do nothing for us. Mm -hmm. Now, that needs to change. 
if that electoral system was changed so that the residents of Georgetown voted directly for that mayor, that mayor therefore became directly answerable to them, there would be a lot of changes taking place. Mm -hmm. First of all, the position would be that much more desirable because the mayor would not see himself as wholly beholden to the political party that he that he has been, you know, begging for. <clears throat> Second, he'll be answerable to the people, and therefore he has to make decisions for the benefit of the people. If complaints come to him, he will have to fix the complaints. If the engineering department's taking too long, he got to fix it. If the constabulary is not doing its work, he's got to fix it. If the markets, Starbuck market and border market, crime rampant, mm -hmm. they don't do anything. City council does nothing at all. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they are not answerable to the people. Suddenly, he would have to do his job or he'd be out of a job. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a flip side to that, and we have to be fair to the main city council. They don't have money. Right. People will say, why give them money? If you give them money, they're corrupt and they'll waste it. Well, the solution to that is not to starve them. Because guess what? We have had a succession of governments that have starved the main city council, and we get what we deserve. We get a city that is choking on its own garbage, that uh, the administration is poor, that the staff is demotivized, de demotivated, and we have to fix that. So you've got to inject money in there, and how do you do it? Let me tell you how the system works. The chief valuation officer of Guyana is obligated every five years, on the old legislation that we inherited from the British that we like to bat off, he is obligated <coughs> to value all the properties in the city of Georgetown every five years. And rates and taxes are paid as a percentage of that valuation. So the reason it's done every five years is because in five years you might have a shack that somebody buys and turns it into a mansion. And if you don't have the valuation officer going around every five years, the rates and taxes payable on that mansion will be the same as when it was a shack because he will never have adjusted it to say, well, now there's a mansion. The last time the chief valuation officer was empowered, was given the resources to do a valuation in the city of Georgetown, was 1996. <laughs> you think how the city of Georgetown has changed in 1996, and then you check to see what rates property owners in, in Georgetown are paying. Some of them paying $13,000 a year, some paying $20,000 a year on properties that are worth $100 million. In that situation, you have starved the entity that is created and needs funds to clear the garbage. So we quarrel with garbage in the city. Whose fault is that? They have no money to pay to buy trucks or to pay poor ones or to pay C ones. We quarrel about drainage in the city. Whose fault in that is that? They have no money to ensure that the drains are cleaned and maintained and to stop the people who live next to the drains from building over the drains and blocking the drains. They have no policing system. We talk about roads in the city. Whose fault is that? Our budget should have seen an allocation of money to the chief valuation officer and insisted that he does his job and he values these properties so that we have a meaningful, realistic assessment of rates so that people who have these huge businesses start paying rates that are commensurate with the value of their investment, with the value of their profit, so that there is money circulating and the main city council is empowered and financially enabled to do their job. Then, when they don't do their job as we know they won't, because there is so much incompetence. We need to change our legislative system so that the people elect them directly, so that they are accountable to the people. And if we don't like what the mayor is doing, we can vote him out. If we do those two things, we have solved the problem in Georgetown, because there is so much thriving business going on in Georgetown that there should be enough money for every road to be paved, for every drain to be clean, and for the hucksters and the thieves and the bandits that you find in the market for the market to be safe and clean for the city to be a joy to live in. It isn't. But you have to ask whose fault is that? I think it is our fault because of the apathy that we are accustomed to our oppression and we do nothing at all. Good. Um, you know, and I, I just want to 
um, whom the, the political side of that is understanding that, as I had mentioned earlier, sometimes if we look at solving one issue, it, it, it sometimes causes, you know, more of an issue or, or creates more of an unbalance on the other side and understanding that in order for our, our problems to be resolved here, it's multi-tier, meaning multiple things have to happen almost simultaneously in order for the system to be resolved. No. And you use such an interesting example when it comes to mayor and city council being ac uh, um, accountable to the people. But I can even go even further as saying, what is the difference in our parliamentarian situation? So we have uh, a list, as we all know, our, our, our electoral system is a list system. So when you go to the polling booths, you, you vote for a, a list of candidates. You would vote for a head of the list, you vote for the party, and then they select the people that they want to put in those parliamentarian seats. So once again, you have that detachment and lack of forward-facing the people um, um, representatives in parliament. They all of a sudden are now protected by this political party that has somehow, not somehow, but has managed to, what's the word you use, to, to maneuver themselves kind of away from, from facing the issues head on, right? There's no public accountability. So my question to you again, and, and it comes back to making sure that at the end of the day, I believe the key to fixing any country or any society is accountability to the people that put you there. And unless we really start resolving one issue, and I'm, I'm going to hammer you again with the political question. Because you have to go to the central government. You have to go to, 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 to the organization. Put it this way. The organization that gives, allocates money to the mayor and city council. Because it is a trickle-down effect we're talking about here. If, it, if, if there's a problem at the top, then you're obviously going to have a problem at the bottom. So, you know, uh, in all aspects of our society. So my question again is, if you had to look at a larger political solution we have to start speaking about things like constituency based representation when it comes to to parliamentary seats um you know what's your take on this well kian i think everybody will agree with that everybody wants to be empowered by having a say and having a voice in the person who is pretending to represent them in parliament mm -hmm. <clears throat> Lyndon, Lynd Lyndon got a seat but most Lyndoners don't know who represents them in parliament but you have gone to an issue which will require constitutional reform. Okay. And the lawyer in me recognizes that for there to be constitutional reform and therefore a two-thirds vote in Parliament to achieve that, we can't do that. Because the two ethnocentric parties are not going to easily release the hold that they have. So we have to try to devise means to effect change with what is achievable. Now, we started this conversation by saying the PPP have 33 of the 65 seats in Parliament. And we do remember that before 2020, APNU had 33 of the 65 seats. It's quite a, it's quite a thin, in fact, it's a razor thin edge. And I think that what is achievable is a majority opposition in Parliament. And with a majority opposition in Parliament, you can change the law and the legal system as to how you elect your mayor. You can change the law and the legal system as to how you deal with your mm -hmm. chief valuation officer. Okay. Those are not constitutional level changes. The local government so, structure. So they are manageable okay. with just that majority in Parliament. And I think a majority opposition in Parliament will support that. The thing is that when you have the power in Parliament, when you're the government, you, you don't have any incentive to change that because you call the budget and you pass the budget and you spend the money. <laughs> I gotcha. All right. On that note, I, I know we have a lot. This conversation can go on for days and days. <laughs> so what I'm going to um, hopefully we're going to have you back again soon because I know there are a lot of areas that we still haven't touched on completely. We got infrastructure. Um, road development, etc. Um, we have reached the end of our hour here. 
um, on apolitically incorrect Guyana. So, uh, as you know, Mr. Timothy Jonas, um, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show with us this evening. We hope to, like I said just now, have you again very soon. I, I like, like I'm sure most Guyanese, I'm enthralled with your with your analysis and and, and opinion and input on how we could uh, make Guyana a better place. Um, we're on here every Friday from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. And I invite all to join us. Um, what I'm going to try to do next time is I'm going to try to get our phone lines up because I know just, I, I can tell you personally, and I'm sure you like myself, it's always, I think, necessary to hear the feedback from the people out there, from Guyanese that are living in this daily, you know, and what their opinions are or, and, 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 and how they can see making their own lives better. Because as we just said, empowering the people is key. Accountability to the people is key. What do they want or what power do they need to make their lives better? Yes. Very much. All right. So once again, thank you for having, it, having us. Um, this program has come to an end. Thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you here next week. Thank you, Bobby. Take care. <laughs>